Hello again. I am Dan Wu. This is the show Unquestionable. Every Monday from noon to 1 p.m., we host a conversation, sometimes a debate, with a person related to whatever I find interesting that week. 831 is the area code, 459 4036 is the more specific phone number here in the studio. You can call in with your questions, comments, recommendations. Sometimes we take them, sometimes they're funny. Because as a non commercial educational radio station, KZSE supports free expression of ideas. Please be aware that the opinions expressed to those of the speakers are artists only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the UC Regents, KZSE staff, management, or underwriters. We welcome your feedback on our programming. Please direct your comments to the Program Review Committee by calling 831-459-4726 or by emailing prc at kzsc.org. And again, the number in the studio here is 831 459 Four zero three six, and today on Unquestionable, we have Jennifer Bester of the San Francisco area peninsula in the studio here to discuss Prop 13, which is a law that often gets a lot of press around election time, but seems to be getting a lot of press this year and coming up towards 2020. And I'll just get right to it. How are you doing, Jennifer? Just fine. Thank you for caring about this stuff, Dan. It's it's an affliction. It's true. So just first off, let's get your take on what Prop 13 is for the listeners out there that maybe know the number and they've heard it, maybe they know nothing about it, or maybe they think they know a lot about it and would love to call in and and pose their idea. Well, originally Prop 13 was advertised as tax relief. And so what it has been is a series of rules that reduce property tax and m- keep it at predictable levels as long as an owner maintains ownership of record of that property. So originally it was around tax relief and uh, property tax. What has happened since property tax was a very, very large portion of California's revenues, what has happened is it has become something that's very inextricably tied up and confusing to all of our understanding about how our local services are funded. Now, let's uh, maybe take that into the origins of Prop 13. I did discuss this if you are somehow a regular listener that heard my show on Prop 13 earlier this summer. I had on the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association Vice President of Communications, Susan Shelley, on talking about Prop 13 from a very pro-Prop 13 perspective and a group that always moves to expand the discounts that Prop 13 bestowed upon property owners and to keep them in place and to extend them. That's, That's their goal as an organization. Maybe talk about when Prop 13 came about and who Howard Jarvis is, possibly. Well, Prop 13 was enacted in the spring of 1978. Uh, It was enacted because property values were increasing very rapidly, something that I think most of us could recognize today. And property taxes, as a result, were also increasing. Uh, So people throughout the state, homeowners, property owners throughout the state, felt very uncomfortable that they could not 
realistically forecast what their property tax payments would be, and they were fearful that they were going to go up disproportionately. Howard Jarvis was uh, an out-of-state, well, he came in from out-of-state, settled in Los Angeles, uh, ran many times for uh, various positions, including, I believe, governor, um, and was the uh, president or director of the Los Angeles Apartment Owners Association. So he was somebody who had, I believe, been interested in uh, tax reduction for quite a long time, and particularly as regarded property tax, since that was significant to his constituents in the Apartment Owners Association. And so when Prop 13 was passed, to give a little detail on what Prop 13 is, when, when it became passed originally, is that it capped property tax at 1% of the market value or the assessed value of a property back to either 1975 prices or when it was bought. So if you bought it later and it was assessed at a higher value, it would obviously it would be the 1%, but it might be a larger amount than someone that bought it earlier. And the Howard Jarvis Association has on their website that it's in response to a 2.67% property tax rate in 1977. And they wanted to lower that down to 1% and keep it down there or near there. Can you talk about how true that number is and how that number comes about and were people really paying that much on their properties to the point where maybe this was that necessary as a number that's an average and so it would depend very much about where we were speaking so if we were talking for example about san francisco in fact the percentage was higher san francisco was a high tax, high service city. Uh, it was, you know, highly urban, and um, I don't have the number right in front of me, but I believe it was more like three percent. If we were talking about a suburban area with relatively uh, solid property values, then the percentage would have been lower. It would have been two uh, percent, one and three quarters percent. In some places, it was actually even below one percent. So there was a broad spectrum across the state. The important thing to realize there is what it was made up of was a number of constituent tax levies. So every major local service levied a percentage tax on property to provide its service. So your schools, for example, might levy something between maybe one and one and a quarter percent. Your uh, city would levy money, Your uh, would levy a percentage. Your county would levy a percentage for county services. You might have additional uh, districts, a community college district, um, and so forth. And so what that percentage was was actually the cumulative levy for all the local services to which you were entitled. And so... Fast forward all the way from spring and June, June when this was voted on in 1978, all the way to the budget cycle of all the way further forward to 1979. Talk about the impact of it in the immediate sense, especially in places, you can pick a spot, but especially in a place where the revenue was a higher percentage and it was capped at 1% all of a sudden. So you're going from 3% to 1% in some of these areas. Talk about the immediate impact on local services. And I will add for listeners, my perspective as someone who wasn't alive then, but has lived for quite a while now in a state where people are always talking about how our schools are underfunded and they are crumbling and how education is terrible and people are putting their kids in private school when they can't afford to. Um, can you talk about the immediate impact in 1979 on local services? Well, there were there were a number of things that went on. So, first of all, 
Proposition 78 was enacted right before the, the Proposition, Proposition 13. 13. I'm no sorry. worries, no worries. Right before the 1978 uh, property tax bills went out and right before the end of the 1977-1978 fiscal year for cities, counties, schools, etc. So immediately after the passage of Prop 13, there was basic... Uh, Chaos is too strong a word, but, you know, confusion and so forth. And what happened was the state came in with its budget surplus, and it backfilled about uh, two-thirds of the losses that the local services, and that's schools or cities or whatever, about two-thirds of the losses that they'd encountered. And it did this across the state. Now, this meant that the state suddenly had to write checks to a thousand school districts it had to write checks to 500 cities it had to write checks to 58 county governments and all sorts of other uh, fire districts and things like that so anyway that was what happened immediately after prop 13 and again there was a loss to those local services of probably in the neighborhood of two to three a billion dollars which was substantial but then in the next year, the state said, okay, I'm not, we're not going to write all these checks for various reasons. Instead, you cities and counties go in and whatever we wrote you a check for last year, go in and take that money out of your school districts. So we'll take responsibility for backfilling the schools. You backfill yourselves out of the school districts. So what that had the effect of doing was really throwing the onus of Prop 13 onto the schools. Now, this was, I believe, exactly what Howard Jarvis had intended. Uh, I was alive then. I was a property owner then, um, just by one year. Uh, But when you look at the budget, uh, not the budget, the voter guide arguments for Prop 13, what you see is Howard Jarvis and the Harvard Jarvis Association assuring voters that police and fire and all these other services would be maintained and not mentioning schools. Now, why is this significant? Well, schools were consuming over 50% of the local property tax uh, revenues at that point. So it was a little bit like saying, well, we'll throw your sister off the boat and you'll be fine. But it also relates to the fact that police and fire and these, especially police, are generally, although they're public employees, they're often aligned with things that you wouldn't think of most other public employees being aligned with. And people want to... People hold the word safety very strongly in elections. So as long as you say you're going to maintain the police department, then they're pretty much fine with maybe not having those, you know, liberal teachers funded at such a high amount. I... Just in the sense of, like, trigger words for elections, I think police cuts are something that's very different than school cuts in people's minds. Also, at that time... And now, a lot of people have their own personal reservations about what's being taught in public schools. And so they're very much more okay with schools being cut rather than police. What do you think about the the reasons why those cuts were okay in people's minds and police and firefighters weren't okay, I guess? Well, uh, part of this has to do with, in my opinion, and, and this is my opinion as opposed to what I love to talk about or our facts and numbers and analysis, But in my opinion and my recollection of the time, part of what was going on was also a lot of confusion around funding the schools. Now, first of all, there was a massive budget surplus up in Sacramento. Uh, Jerry Brown was governor for the first time. He was very fiscally conservative then, as now, and had built up this big surplus that even he could not predict uh and it was growing rapidly secondly there had been something called serrano v priest which was a ruling that said uh no you can't just fund your schools based on local property tax that's not equitable so you have to backfill poorer schools with 
something, and the something was uh, state uh, income tax. So y- you had quite a lot of confusion in the public mind right then of who was funding schools, who was capable of funding schools, who should be funding schools. And yes, then it was very easy to say, well, don't worry about all this other stuff. That can be funded with your property tax. Kick the schools, uh, you know, up the street. So yeah, there were arguments about all the things you're talking about, but I think there was also a lot of confusion in people's minds. And that money was never really restored to schools in California, and the cuts have continued to happen, especially at a per-student basis. And I want to maybe shift gears, especially as the population has grown, the budget has never caught up to what it was in, say, the mid-60s for per-student spending in California. But I want to, on that note, that's a good segue to first off say that it's 831-459-4036 if you'd like to join in the conversation i also can take in text messages at that number on the screen here please no shorthand or sms that would be great to get your idea across clearly and make me sound intelligent on the air and this is a great segue to ask you to introduce how you became an expert in prop 13 and what background you have that led you to knowing so much about this and how the schools are funded in California and how it relates to our tax system? Well, first of all, thank you for the introduction as a sort of accidental expert because that's very much what it was. I I was the treasurer of my son's elementary school parent-teacher organization in 2006. We heard that there were going to be cuts to education spending and I was asked, did we need to raise more in terms of membership uh, fees or or, uh, contributions. And so I went and I found out that, in fact, our school district is the Menlo Park City School District in uh, uh, Menlo Park in the Silicon Valley, was funded primarily from local property taxes. And, in fact, we probably would not suffer a lot And furthermore, that we had an educational foundation that was raising money and we had uh, parcel taxes that had been passed and that were being considered. And so we, as a parent-teacher organization, didn't need to worry about it. So I sort of said, oh, okay, fine. But I remembered that there had been an article about commercial property tax and the fact that commercial property turned over less frequently. And so commercial property owners were getting kind of a free ride on the back of uh, what was supposed to be keeping old people in their homes. And uh, so I began to research this, you know, I don't know, six months or eight months later, just because I was curious. And because my background is in finance, I was, uh, I worked for uh, over 20 years in accounting and finance. I have an MBA from Stanford. And um, I, I could do the analysis and I actually was willing to pay the $300 to buy the assessment rolls in our area and uh, I put them through Excel and did pivot tables and began to see what that article writer had been talking about but see it on the main street of my town, see it on my street. Um, so I, there was something very physical about it for me. There was something very understandable about it for me because I knew my town. So that was kind of how I got started in it. And then, of course, the minute I knew something about it, the school board, other people started to ask me about it, including the um, Assembly Budget, com- uh, excuse me, Revenue and Taxation Committee. So I ended up testifying to them. And I, you know, accidentally, I learned a lot about this stuff. I, I deconstructed the redevelopment agency because the school board had a question. At that time, I was also volunteering in the library of a school on the quote-unquote other side of the tracks, in our case, the other side of the freeway, uh, in the Ravenswood School District, which is one of the most disadvantaged school districts in the state, uh, also in the Silicon Valley. And one day I was in the library, the librarian walked in, she was in tears, I said, what's the matter? And she said, We're all being laid off. All of the librarians across this 
school district, 97% disadvantage, 97% low income English learner school district are being laid off and also all of the computer science, uh, this computer uh, support people. So, and, that, and that was in 2006. No, that was actually, I'm sorry, that was in 2012. Okay, and sorry. And at, at that point, I sort of learned an awful lot, not just about the property tax side of advantaged districts like mine, but the property tax side of disadvantaged districts uh, like the Ravenswood district. And that meant learning a lot about how the state allocates money, its money, its income tax to school districts. So it's very clear that the stunting of property tax increases has had a long lasting effect on, as you said, uh, the turnover of property, of funding to schools, of various uh, ripple effects from this, some intended, some maybe unintended. And you mentioned retail versus residential and about seniors staying in their homes. And can you talk about very briefly about how Prop 13 was advertised and how a lot of groups gained advantages through it that maybe weren't advertised when the bill was sold to people? Well, and again, Prop 13 was passed 40 years ago. So you're asking for my recollection of 40 years ago, plus what I've found in the literature and so forth since. And based on your research. And based on, based, yeah, based on my research, based on uh, actually a great deal of academic research that's been done into this. Um, it was sold mainly as keeping old people in their homes. That was the, the, the heart tug. Um, pointing out how assessed values had risen with the skyrocketing residential property rate, uh, property values. Um, but in fairness, it also was touted as a benefit to business because, of course, business property owners were also experiencing this, uh, increase in their in their property taxes so that's the way it was sold um what was given to people though was kind of a zero one choice vote for it or don't the only other option was a very nebulous uh proposition initiative put out proposition put out by the legislature that sort of said well give us the opportunity to charge different amounts to different types of owners and maybe we'll do it. So that was uh, actually Proposition 8 that was on the ballot at the time. So basically this was put out as something to help older people stay in their homes. What it ended up being was a major, major windfall to commercial property owners. Why? Because commercial property owners turns over less frequently, second, because there are very large parcels in commercial property and it's worth it to lawyer up and work your way around the rules for transfer of ownership so that you're able to maintain a very early tax year and therefore a very early tax basis. And the lasting effects of having residential and commercial property or as you said, commercial residential and commercial industrial, you also make that distinction with meaning like a landlord that owns a lot of units would be commercial residential. And the long lasting effects of having all of those groups included in this has really depleted the tax base to the point where some estimate in the tens of billions of dollars that have not gone to services and have not maybe been replaced in any other form, even as the population of California has, I believe, doubled in that time period, approximately. Well, I, there are a lot of moving parts here. So uh, the the estimate that I think you're referring to was uh, came out of 
USC's um, Paris group, P-E-R-E-S group, and they estimate that just on the commercial industrial side, now this is not residential at all, either apartments or single-family homes, but just on the commercial industrial side, the difference at the 1% rate between current assessed values and current market values would raise about uh, $12 billion, $11 billion something. Um, so that's on that side. Now, usually the Legislative Analyst Office, which is one of the best sources for this type of information, uh, usually they say that commercial industrial is about a third of the property tax base here in California, uh, commercial residential another third, and uh, single-family homeowners another third. So uh, I can't tell you what the, the gap might be on the commercial residential side, but it looks like the gap is about $11 billion between assessed value and market value on the uh, commercial industrial side, assuming that you levy the 1% tax against that. So the reason I ask about that, I, I know that you know these numbers really well. Uh, full disclaimer to the audience, I actually did a pre-interview for this, and uh, it's not scripted, but Jennifer knows so much about this material that... Uh, we had to get together and talk and narrow this down to a point that was, as she said, not deceiving. She didn't want to simplify things to the point of being deceiving. But also, I was very insistent that we did not want to lose everyone. And a lot of people, we do have a call coming in, and we will get to that in like a minute or two. And I really like that. 831-459-4036. After they're done, you can call in or you can text me at that number as well. A lot of people, you talk about commercial industrial and commercial residential and residential residential, but a lot of people, when they want to change this law, want to keep the tax breaks for people living in their homes, all residential in fact, and want to take away the discounts for people in commercial properties, uh, commercial industrial, shopping malls, uh, retail stores, restaurants, factories, all of those types of things. And you have a slightly different take on that whole thing. Can you talk about where you differ from people that want to keep it for residential, the discounts, and take away the discounts for commercial and industrial and have them replenish our tax base through that method? Well, Dan, as you know, I, uh, I'm sort of agnostic about these things in the sense that I'm not an economist. I'm not somebody who's out there trying to champion some new way of doing things. Um, I, I just sort of look at this all and shudder and have learned so much about it by accident. Um, in learning about it, though, what I've seen is what I will call subsidies. So if you bought in the last 10 years and about 50% of all residential owners have bought in the last 10 years, you're paying about $1.40 per dollar of services. If you bought 30 years or more ago, then you're paying about 20 cents for that same dollar that you're entitled to of local services. Looking at this a little differently, if there are six property owners out there, residential property owners, three of them are paying $1.40 one of them is paying 20 cents, and then there are two, one from more, the decade before this and... Or the 90s or, the, yeah. And one from, yeah, two decades before. And they are, uh, and they're paying roughly 95 cents, 65 cents. So you've got the current folks subsidizing the past folks. So when somebody comes to me and says, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to bring up this whole segment to market value. I mean, I have to admit that I kind of shudder a little bit because I realize that the same relationships exist on the commercial industrial side and the commercial residential side. And so you're kind of saying we're going to move everybody up to paying, uh, to, to overpaying for their entitlement on public services. And on the one hand, you know, I've watched a lot of manipulation, I'll say, or lawyering up to get low property tax bases to, to continue that original year of uh, 
of ownership early year. I've seen the transfer through inheritance of a lot of property and, you know, out of state, uh, you know, wealthy out of state people who are members of yacht clubs and golf clubs overseas and all this kind of stuff. I've seen them getting the same benefit that was supposed to be for poor old people on fixed income. So I've seen all that and I can sort of see the punitive benefit of going after them and saying, yeah, pay a dollar forty, guys. If if you couldn't get yourselves together to to figure out how to redo this, then you commercial industrial should pay. On the other hand, I am kind of one of these people that says if this is what we're going to have as a tax system, acquisition based, then please let's have a cutoff for commercial industrial. 20 years, 25 years, rather than saying, okay, all of you have to come up to date all the time or every three years, which is one of the things that's being proposed. So I think the important part in that is that you're saying that new homeowners are paying a higher rate than people that have owned their homes a long time. And at the same time, you were saying that new business owners new people that own the building that their business is in, that they are also paying a much higher rate than the businesses near you. And that's what you saw in Menlo Park. That's the part that you said was very physical to you because you were looking not only at the residential property, but like downtown Menlo Park, where you could see, I'm, exactly. I know Menlo Park's tiny. They have a downtown, correct? We have we have very nice downtown. Okay. I encourage uh, you to come and visit it. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I accidentally drive through Menlo Park. Usually it's so tiny, but my mom was born there. Our main um, street is Santa Cruz Avenue. Let me put in a pu- plug for Santa Cruz. Maybe Our that's main how my family Santa ended Cruz up Avenue. here. Okay. Um, but that you were looking at the commercial property and that, that people that own businesses are also subs. It's not just the residential side. And so you, that's why you are hesitant to say that you want to split it residential and commercial, correct? Because you see business owners struggling, new business owners struggling in the same way that new homeowners are struggling. Well, let's just to say make I up see for the older owners. I see new commercial property owners having to pay a significant premium, just like new residential owners, and at the same time, I see long-term ones, uh, get, you know basically getting this really super subsidy. Now, one thing that I will say has changed dramatically, and I did live in Menlo Park in in, um, 1976, so I was familiar with Menlo Park before uh, Prop 13 and uh, moved back in uh, 1986, so so Menlo Park is home. Um, One thing I've noticed was that business owners used to own property in Menlo Park. Now it's become commercial property owners. So one of the strange things that at least I've observed from Prop 13 is it has made it attractive to hang on to property uh, and rent it out. So actually nowadays new businesses almost overwhelmingly are lessers rather than, or lessees rather, than uh, property owners. I noticed the same thing in Santa Cruz. It's kind of mysterious who owns a lot of these nice old buildings we have in our downtown, and it's hardly ever the shop owner. We did get a call, and I know this is something that you, I think you said that it hasn't borne much fruit in your your research of the issue, but I do want to mention that part of Prop 13, for the listeners at least, you don't have to comment on it if you don't want to, uh, but the caller called in and said that Prop 13 also requires a two-thirds vote to pass any new taxes in California as a way of them safeguarding their measure so that people couldn't just pass other taxes to make up for the cut in the property tax as easily. People can't do it as easily to make up for that. And that has been an issue of contention for a lot of people, especially in a state that's majority one party and sometimes 60, 62 percent one party. And the uh, as the caller said that one third of the legislature or one third of the population can hold back any sort of change to any revenue base and i do want your thought on the fact that i asked susan shelley from the howard jarvis taxpayer association about the fact that 
Prop 13 itself passed by 62%, which means it did not even, it overhauled our tax system and said two thirds are required to pass taxes, but it did not even pass by the standard that it's holding other laws to. Uh, what would you say to someone who defends Prop 13, but then say it didn't even pass by the standard that you think that massive tax changes should pass by? I would say yes, Dan. Okay, okay. I just wanted to give, obviously, credit to the caller. Jennifer Bester did not find a lot of fruit in this subject matter, and uh, we will have, we will film the episode next time so you can see her face. But we didn't do that this time. And I want to say really quickly, before we take a quick break, because that was a fun little moment that allows for that, I'm going to play a minute of my friend's homebrew track. It's called Mirrors. They're at homebrewsantacruz.bandcamp.com, and they're very nice to let us use their music on the air. And we're going to talk about possible changes coming up to Prop 13 and what Jennifer Bester thinks about all of that. Came to prop up others, but I'm drooping, can't stay still. I'm weak as some progress, can't escape from myself. Break all the mirrors, don't be afraid of bad luck, cause it's the only car we have here. Break all the mirrors, don't be afraid of bad news, cause it's the only car we have here. It's easy to Repelling everything I find Searching, not finding any shred of peace of mind Is it courage to boldly admit to all I lack? Imagine Phantom Father is never coming back Break all the mirrors, don't be afraid of bad news Cause it's the only kind we have here Break all the mirrors, don't be afraid of bad luck Cause it's the only kind we have I'm no better than you Are you better than me? Cause I'm no better No better I play my hand And welcome back You're here on Unquestionable I'm Dan Wu This is KZSC Santa Cruz I'm in the studio this afternoon With Jennifer Bester Reluctant expert on Prop 13. We got a call also mentioning that Prop 13 requires a two-thirds majority vote to raise taxes, which is very true, and it was a measure of this bill. It was a portion of Prop 13 in 1978 that safeguarded its effects from just being undone by a majority vote. Prop 13, to recap for anyone just tuning in, capped property taxes at 1% in California and set them back to 1975 and if it was bought 1975 or earlier and also is a cap at 1% with a small increase of 2% a year. So essentially 1% for a long time at whatever year it was bought. So if you bought it in 1995, its value in 1995, 1% is your property tax cap and it goes up 2% a year, so it can't even double. And I want to, to, for many, many years, and on that note, my grandfather owns a home on the west side of Santa Cruz that he bought in 1972 with my great-grandma's loan to them. That's my shout-out to my grandma. Um, but if you do the math on that, his property tax bill could only go up for 2% every year for the last 43 years. So essentially... It's doubled during that time while his property value has gone up, I would guess, 3,000 or 4,000 percent. But his property tax bill has gone up 200 percent, which is a pretty good deal for my grandpa. But Jennifer has some, uh, some family heirloom information on how Prop 13 affects people on the micro level as well. And I, I think it's really interesting to know because... 
costs of things go up a lot faster, I think, than the revenue that is funding our public services if this is the way that we're going to do things. Go ahead, Jennifer. Well, I was struck when you said on the air uh, about, what, six weeks ago that your grandfather had bought property in 1972 because my uncle had brought property in Fremont in 1972. And he was a big supporter of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. And I never quite understood why. But when he died last year, um, I uh, inherited uh, the property, which I've since sold. Uh, But I also inherited his property tax file. And um, so I actually know exactly what he paid in property tax um, each and every year from 1972 to now. And I think it's important what the value of the property ended up being or what it was at the beginning as well. Okay, so let me just start out and say that he bought the property for uh, $27,000. And I'm going to round everything to thousands or hundreds because otherwise I'll, I'll keep you here all night, happily, but all night. Um, so he bought it for 27000 in 1972, and his first tax bill came in, and it was assessed for less than what he'd paid for it. It was assessed for only 24000 uh, 24000 yes. So anyway, those of us who remember the times remember that sort of experience. Anyway, so in his that first hurts. year, he paid uh, $700. In his, so, and the, you know, that was pre-Prop 13. Right, the percentage was higher. So the, yeah, so the, percent, the percentage was higher, and so so forth. In his second year, in 1973, it dropped to $600. Why? Because the homeowner's exemption was raised from 3000 to 7000 in that year. So actually, his first experience was dropped to 600 Then the next year, his assessment, uh, his assessed value went up, so it was back at 700 then it was 800 Then in 1976-77, it was just short of $1,000. So we're starting to see, you know, here, this is what was happening to people. Then he got his 1977-78. It was uh, almost uh, 1,200. It was 1,150. So then after Prop 13 is the next one. 412. So 400. And then the next year, 400, 400, 400. I'm going to speed up. 400, 400, 400, 400, 400, 400. Let's see. What's 1993? Uh, 1993, 447. Uh, 1999. Uh, 522. Okay, so what was it last year before you sold it? <laughs> and last year before That's I sold 40, it, it was 866 40. So he paid $866 in property tax on a home that sold for... 940000 Okay. And so the, the new what would people... The proper, what would be the percentage on that? Uh, okay, so at the 1%, now I should point out that included in my numbers were the bond... Uh, there's their bond levies, their parcel taxes, all of those things. The only thing I have not included in these numbers uh, is sewer, because sewer around the state. Now, don't don't look at me the way you are, Dan. Sewer. I'm giving actually, you the two thirds look. The look you gave me with the two thirds. Oh, thing. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm going down the I'm going yeah. down the rabbit hole. Okay, but sewer is the one ex- exception that I'm making. So anyway, yes. So here is a property that the people who bought it are now paying. Twelve thousand uh, dollars. Well, twelve thousand dollars a year in property tax for that. We were paying nine hundred. And people that still own their homes from that period of time are paying nine hundred dollars on a home that was twenty five thousand dollars in nineteen seventy two. You got it. And people that are buying homes in Capitola for two point five million dollars are paying like thirty thousand dollars a year right so actually all in you were what you were pressing me for was okay well when did this catch up so the first time that he paid more than he had his first year was 2002 including sewer excluding tossing sewer out the first time that the check that he (laughs) wrote yeah that's a nice image right the first time that the check that he wrote uh, for just property tax, not sewer, was bigger, was 2012. Okay. So then when you look at what you were saying, people paying a dollar forty, the person paying a th- $30,000 a year is maybe paying a dollar forty, and the person paying a $1,000 a year is paying 20 cents, and they're each getting a dollar of services. You mentioned a possible idea of having a cutoff. So instead of 1975, because that sounds great in 1978, you say, oh, it's 1978, let's cap the values at 1975. 
But when you fast forward 43 years, it's like, wait, should we maybe have it 20 years? And, and I'm not going to get into other things. There's, there's another law that uses 1995 as a marker, which I have huge problems with. I'm like, why can't it just be a 10-year exemption? And what would be your framework of saying, okay, maybe you don't get to keep this massive static discount forever, but yes, for those, especially for those first years like of ownership when you're paying huge interest payments on your mortgage and things like that, what kind of framework would you as a homeowner and as a California resident think is reasonable, like giving new homeowners 10 years of the, the, the static discount and maybe phasing it slowly out or 15 years or what would you say so that we don't end up with this static, stagnated uh, pricing that doesn't fund our services to the point where our state can survive. Okay. So I have not done a lot of analysis on the homeowner side. Yeah, I'm asking and for your opinion again. I am again. going to assume, I'm going to assume that Californians like it for homeowners. Okay. So, uh, so, so let me just say though, the one thing that I don't understand and there's been a lot of good analysis out of the legislative analyst office and other places recently, including the LA Times, uh, has been the inheritance, the ability to inherit this. Because I inherited my parents' property in Carmel. I'm paying a fraction of what, uh, of the benefits that I'm able to hand to the people who rent from me. I'm charging them market rates. Um, so, uh, I'll stay away from homeowners, but I will say if you're a commercial property owner and you are able to charge market rates for your services or your property, then it does seem to me that to keep everything fair, a 20 to 25 year cap, restart the clock. That way you can predict where you're going to be, but not only would that raise probably $8 billion on the, uh, of the $11 billion that we said would conceivably available on the commercial industrial side, but probably a similar amount on the commercial residential side. And as coming full circle, as a PTA member, your, your son's graduated now from the public school system, but as someone who cares about other parents in your area and in California, what do you think that 11 billion could do from your research and your opinion? What do you see those new revenues in a new system doing for our school system that people either like to bemoan they they say oh my god the schools are crumbling and it's terrible or they say the schools are terrible and they like hold it against the schools when it's really the schools that aren't getting any money and that's why they're crumbling well i think there are a few things here the first one is where the money goes um i told you that i have kind of a fairness issue with saying let's bring uh commercial 100 percent up to market while these other two groups aren't there would be a lot of businesses that would have to seriously adjust in that case that's true well well it, it just you know okay if we're gonna do this in the economy let's, for a while yes let's let's level the playing field in the sense of let's not let them get away with uh lawyering up to keep an early tax basis but on the other hand if this is the game we're playing well let's let's all play the same game but the other issue is on the allocation side, and we haven't talked about this, but one of the really dreadful things to me has been the way that uh, property tax has been taken away from the schools exactly the way that I just described for uh, 1979, where, you know, okay, it's supposed to be split the way that it was before uh, Prop 13, Except then we go in and we backfill cities and counties from the schools. Then, actually, in 1992, the state uh, grabbed a bunch of money away from the cities and counties and said, okay, we're going to spend this on the schools. But it was actually the state spending it on a state's obligation to schools. So this is called the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund. Then in 2004, the state grabbed the Educational Revenue Augmentation Fund away from the schools and handed it back to the cities and counties to pay off its uh, vehicle a license fee obligation to them. So we've got this shell game across the state and 
I have a real issue with the fact that none of us knows where our property tax is going. I probably know more than most people. But what it's meant for schools is if we take that money away, will it get to the schools? Probably not. We mentioned the $11 billion. Uh, there is an initiative that is qualified for the 2020 ballot. It's called the Schools and Local Communities Initiative. I know the people behind it. They are incredibly well-intentioned. They're trying to do the right thing, but they didn't bother to research allocation. And so actually less than a third of the money would go to schools. Much more would go to uh, county governments, about 36 percent. Some of it would, the the remainder would go to cities and and, uh, other local services. But this is a case where there's been such a shell game that following the money is almost impossible. That has been incredibly hard in terms of school funding. Now, would it help? Would $8 billion help? Yes, we're spending about $80 billion right now. You've just described a 10% uplift. Would another $8 billion from commercial residential help? Yes, you've just described another 10% uplift. Is this going to get us into the big leagues? Is it going to get us out of, call it, 35th or 41st in the nation? No. Might it get us somewhere more around average or a little better than average? Yes. Do we need to be there? We are a state that has the highest number and percentage of children in poverty. We are a state that has the highest percentage of children uh, who speak a second language, a a different language, non-English at home. These are all very expensive children to educate. We need money to educate them if we believe in quality education, if we believe in public education in California. All right. You can check out more about Prop 13 if you care to. Jennifer Bester did her best job to dumb her amazing knowledge on this issue down to the point where we could have a conversation on the air. I thank you for the caller. It's been unquestionable on KZSC Santa Cruz. I'm Dan Wu. We'll be back next Monday talking about the national parks and all kinds of open spaces in the U.S. that may or may not be open to all kinds of things that may not make them last in the future. So we'll be talking about future funding insecurity for the national parks and open spaces in the U.S. next week, noon, Monday, unquestionable. I'm Dan Wu. I'm going to get out of here and give the studio to Alyssa. And thank you so much for Jennifer Bester for being in here. If you want to find out more about Prop 13, whether you own, rent, run a business, or you're in school, check it out. There's a lot of stuff happening with it, and it's got a huge impact on California. Have a great day.